You know, I've said many times that I, I feel like I have the best job in the world, that I get to hang out with the cool kids and uh, really every day talk to really interesting people that are doing incredibly innovative things and groundbreaking things in um, CRE Tech. And, you know, I write a lot uh, on my blog and we have our events and what have you where we're trying to connect the tech sector with the commercial real estate industry. But one of the things that I found was like, I'm always having these amazing conversations with people every single day, startups, VCs, investors, developers, brokers. And I just said to myself that, you know, wouldn't it be great if people could hear these conversations because they're really extraordinary and inspiring. And I really want to start doing more video as a way to sort of you know, shed light on all the interesting things that are happening in CRE Tech. So today I'm really excited that I've got uh, five of my really good friends in CRE Tech, all founders. And the other thing about like everything that we do on our platform is we're not a pay to play model. So if you read about somebody in my blog or you see somebody speaking at one of our events or you see somebody on one of these videos that I'm doing, they did not pay me to get here. I mean, I, we're, it's kind of the industry standard to do it that way, but, and I'm sure we're leaving a lot of money on the table, but I just find <laughs> that uh, laughter, soundtrack, but I just found that, you know, the really way to inspire people and to educate people is to get the best possible speaker. So in this version of the, of the, of the vlog, what I wanted to do was to reach out to the founders that really have inspired me, that I think have really broken through and ones that I've known the longest and um, can really talk about you know, their journey and shed some light on some of the things that they've learned to sort of help educate other founders, other startups, and really just inform everybody about some of the innovative things that they're doing. So um, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk to some really great founders and it's my pleasure to introduce them all to you, starting to my left with my friend Gabrielle McMillan of Equium. And Gabby, if you could just introduce yourself and then we'll go down the panel and, you know, and give everybody a, a, a short overview of, of you, how long the company's been around and, and what exactly it is you do. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, let's hope we can all live up to the, yeah. the hype. Um, so Gab McMillan, CEO and founder um, of a business called Equium. Um, Equium, we have a tenant engagement or customer experience platform for commercial real estate. Really, we exist to help landlords unlock more value in their assets through connecting the people in those assets with great experiences and services. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is drive loyalty to that building. Great. Rich? Cool. Um, Rich Sarkis, uh, founder and CEO of a business called Reonomy, which I started um, a little over five years ago now in 2013. Uh, and essentially, Reonomy is a commercial real estate uh, data and analytics company. Uh, we've built this data engine, if you will, a whole bunch of machines, systems, algorithms, throwing buzzwords here and there, AI. Uh, not blockchain yet, but I feel like uh, I've, got, I've got to work on that. You said it. In the exactly. I said it. You know, exactly. Yeah. Um, but that just went up. Exactly. Great. Uh, that just sucks a whole bunch of data that's out there, either in the public domain, from private sources, from some of our clients who share their data with us, and then delivers it back to them. Uh, in either a retail side of the business, which is highly transactional, it's a web-based application, or an enterprise platform that um, our larger clients leverage. Great, Jonathan. Hey, uh, Jonathan Wasserstrom, co-founder and CEO of SquareFoot. SquareFoot helps companies find their perfect space, and we do that by bringing technology and transparency to uh, an industry that uh, hasn't really had much of either, historically. Uh, there's really three things that we do. We have a listings platform that brings the transparency piece. Uh, anybody in the markets that we serve can see uh, what's available the way they do when they look for an apartment. Uh, two, we have a team of in-house brokers that's there to support our clients through the whole process. And then three, because we're a nice little tech company, we, we build products, right? And we build those for the tenants when they're going through the process, for our brokers in-house, and then we'll be launching a landlord business uh, later this year. Awesome, Michael. I'm Michael Mandel. I'm co-founder and CEO of Comstack. Uh, we're a real estate data company. 
our secret sauce is that we crowdsource commercial real estate data. So we have a network of about 16,000 commercial real estate brokers, appraisers, and research people in real estate brokerage firms who share data on Comstack to get other data back out. Um, we're best known for our lease transaction database, including all the details of commercial lease deals that have taken place. Uh, we also track sales comps and property level data and have an analytics layer on top of that. And then we sell access to that data to some of the world's largest commercial real estate investors and lenders. And before I introduce um, Ryan, just a note that we are in Convene's spectacular uh, space in, on 7th Avenue and in Midtown, and we're, we're thrilled to be here, so thanks for accommodating us, Ryan. No, thank you guys. Uh, Ryan Simonetti, uh, co-founder and CEO of Convene. Uh, we like to call Convene a, a workplace hospitality platform uh, that partners directly uh, with some of the top commercial owners uh, you know, here and, and soon to be globally uh, to really help them reimagine human experience in, in an office building. Uh, and we do that by designing, building, and operating uh, a physical network of meeting, event, and conferencing facilities, uh, now flexible workspaces uh, for really enterprise teams between 10 and 100 who have kind of grown out of co-working but don't have the right home for them. Uh, and then we deliver that experience through hospitality, amenities, and services, and that all runs uh, on uh, a proprietary kind of mobile software platform. So um, I'd say we've got different components to our business, uh, both physical and digital, uh, and we're investing heavily in technology and what that means for enabling us to deliver a better human experience. Uh, and, and not only is that technology power and convene, um, but it's also starting to actually power the building itself. And we're a nine-year-old startup, so I've been doing yeah, this for a while, yeah. I think I'm like washed up at this point, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, where I wanted to start off with everybody, uh, and ladies first, of course, was, you know, you, I picked all five of you because when I look at the landscape, and there are many successful startups in the ecosystem, right? But I picked the five of you also because I think you all have very interesting niches within the, the sector, um, but also because I've watched your growth uh, over the years, many of us came in at the same time. Um, and I, and I, I find that, you know, to be a founder in a new industry um, that has never really embraced much tech or had to, it's one of the hardest things to do. And we're all crazy to do it, right? I mean, they're all shaking their heads. We're all <laughs> effing crazy for what we, because I'm sure all of us could go someplace else and make a lot more money, uh, although not Rich, because Rich had a big funding round recently. So, um, <laughs> No, Rich doesn't need any more money. money. You, you, um, my first question, Gabby, be, for you would be, you know, when you look back at your journey, what, what do you attribute the success of Equium to? If you want to succeed Grow. in real estate, number one thing is patience, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you always think the deals are going to get done quicker than what they are. I had someone say to me yesterday on the phone, I said, when are you thinking of making a decision? They said, in two weeks, we're going to be making a decision next two weeks. I said, if that is true, then that will be the fastest that I've ever seen any landlord make a decision. Right? Right. So I think you know the number one thing that I've learned over the time is patience and resilience, and that real estate is fundamentally a slow-moving, um, you know, industry. And we're coming in with new ideas, new tools, um, completely different ways of really thinking about who the customer is and who the building is. You know, I mean, speaking from our personal experience, we you know we started in 2011 in Australia. Um, oh, we did, did, I didn't notice. Do you have a, are you from Australia? <laughs> oh, please. You can say that. Sorry. Um, and now it's like people are like, oh, Equium, you're just this massive success story. But, and we're in one in every three tall office buildings in Australia. So we do have massive market penetration there. But it's taken seven years. You know, some of those deals with those large um, institutional customers are two years in the making, um, mm -hmm. you know, to get one pilot site and then prove it and then roll it out. Um, so, that is what I would say, I would say patience and, and, and resilience. But the other thing that I think has really driven Equium success, and I think anyone that's built a successful technology product would have had to have done this, it started, it's, it started with one real building and one real landlord that had one real problem that they wanted to solve. And we went and we interviewed everyone. This is a, a million square foot office tower in Melbourne. We literally interviewed everyone in the building. You know, so the landlord has this premise that, okay, if I can connect everyone in this building, I can have a database of 4,000 of my customers. I can service them through this platform. I can connect them and I can create this magical ecosystem. So it's a great idea, right? 
but we didn't just build that because right. what is that? Um, so we actually went and met one by one by one with every one of the 60 companies in the building, the 18 retailers, and that was, that was kind of version 1.0. Um, and then every one of the 110 buildings since has a different, you know, every asset is different. Rich, what would you attribute Rianami's uh, success to? Um, just me, just purely me. <laughs> <laughs> is that how you yeah, want yeah, to yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Uh, so modest. Yeah. No, jokes aside, I think, you know, there's a saying I like, which is uh, strategy is, is not what you choose to do, it's what you choose not to do. Mm -hmm. So I think. I need to learn that one, I think. Yeah. My team's probably going, yeah, yeah, I wish Mike would learn so, that. So I think, you know, especially early on, there's a lot that you can do and you get really excited about the size of the asset class, like that there hasn't been real disruption, that there's this thirst for a lot of solutions. So. I think um, what probably stood us in good stead, especially when we were really figuring out how are we going to scale the business to an inflection point, is just being laser focused on um, let's just do a handful of even one thing exceptionally well versus trying to put all of uh, coals in the fire. Because uh, the temptation is, oh, you know, option based reasoning, I'll just throw a lot at, at the wall and see what sticks. That typically you end up doing nothing really well. Uh, and so I've really been a strong, sort of relentless proponent of, of focus, focus, focus Great. for us. Jonathan, you and I, I think you were one of, you and Michael, probably the first folks that I met on, on this journey a long time ago. And I still you, return your phone calls. <laughs> you still do? I still wind up buying lunch for some crazy freaking reason too, which I don't understand, because you just had a very successful raise as well. Um, so looking back at the last seven or so years, you know, at Square Foot's uh, success, what, what would you attribute it to? Friends with Rich. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the golden touch. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it actually, you know, when we first launched the product, we were just gonna do the listings platform and we started doing business development. We launched the business in Texas. Uh, we went around to a whole bunch of these landlords and they looked at us like we had a third eye on our forehead. Uh, nobody's going to be online looking. If people are online looking, it's going to be a bunch of tech dorks like you. So I don't really think that's the case, but we'll see. Um, and we kind of flipped the, the playbook a little bit and went after the demand. Because if you show up on a landlord's doorstep and said, oh, by the way, there's all these people that are online looking that we can deliver to you um, by way of a very great brokerage team, uh, then you can actually start to do things. And uh, it is an extremely slow moving industry uh, for a lot of really good reasons, as frustrating as it probably is for everybody up here. There's some fine reasons why it's as slow moving as it is. Um, so going after the demand side, which is ultimately you know, something that Gabby was saying a minute ago, those are the ultimate customers, which is kind of not typically how the world is looked at. Um, but they are our first customers, right? Our clients. And somebody raises their hand and says, hey, I'm looking for office space and we can help them. Um, so focus on the demand side. Michael, um, I remember when we first met, you were using words like crowdsourcing and the things that nobody had heard of. And of all the startups, I, I remember back in, in those days, I, I've, it, it seems to me that yours was just out there in a good way. And, but here you are, you've, you've grown substantially. The platform is so large now. So obviously, you, you, know, you persevered, you won, you're, just, you're still winning. What do you attribute um, Comstack's success to? I've definitely, I would definitely say we persevered. I wouldn't say we've won. <laughs> <laughs> we're still here. We're still we're surviving. Yes, we're we're surviving. Still, That's we're winning we're in my still, book. You know, we're trying our best and we're trying to grow. Um, you know, I think grit, you know, like it's ultimately grit. And I think, and the willingness to do things however you need to do them. Um, you know, I think when we first kind of told people about the idea, Everybody's like, that's absolutely crazy. Like, nobody's going to share this information with you. You know, people are going to push back against you. You know, the, there's, there's, this is not. You've got to build a two-sided marketplace. You've got to do the chicken or the egg thing. How are you going to pull that off? And it was just a matter of like, you know, when we started, it was me calling up every broker I knew in the industry and asking them to give data, and then bugging them constantly and saying, why haven't you logged in? Why aren't you using it? And then now we have teams of people doing that same thing. I mean, you know, it's just like grinding it out and like trying to surround ourselves with people who are willing to grind it out. Um, we constantly are trying to outsmart the problem and come up with creative technological solutions. And sometimes we succeed and sometimes we don't, I would say, but, like, but we optimize for people who are willing to have the grit to do what it takes 
to make it work. And then, you know, hopefully you get a good enough network effect out of the gritty work that you don't have to do the gritty work anymore. Yeah. And then you go and apply that gritty work somewhere else uh, <laughs> instead of the area where you were before. <laughs> you still have to do it. Yeah, you just yeah. don't have to do it in the same place anymore. Uh, Ryan, with you, you know, you're sort of like the old young man of the industry because you've been at it for so long, man. I mean, I, when I first learned how early Convene was in this space, I was shocked. Like, I mean, that's like, you know, dog years. Like, what, what's been the key to success, longevity, evolution of Convene? Yeah, look, I think what everyone said are all, I think, great pearls of wisdom for, for any founder or founding team. Uh, I was going to use the word grit, uh, <laughs> you know, because um, you know, one, it means a lot to us. One, I think it's a mindset, right? And I think one of the things that all of us would say from a founder's perspective, um, you need that not just in yourself, but in the team that's around you, because at the end of the day, you will a lot of this to happen, right? All of us, to some extent, are changing an industry. Um, and that takes a lot of will to get your customers to commit not just to, to buy a product, but to actually think differently about the way that they're actually running their businesses. And in our case, getting a global landlord who's been very successful for a long time to think differently about how they actually design, build, and operate a building for a 21st century tenant. Um, so definitely grit. Uh, I'd say there's a, a couple other things. Um, one is, uh, there's a saying I love, which is, um, where your focus goes, your energy flows. And that ties into my, one of my other second favorite lines, which is ideas are cheap. And I always tell companies like, we'll see you on the field of execution. And I think there's one thing that we've done well at Convene is while we had a platform vision, is we've attacked it very sequentially. Like, let's solve this problem today and perfect that. Let's use that to layer a new competency in um, because we're solving complex problems. Uh, and I think there's, there's especially when your company's like us, there's so much opportunity in front of you. It, it looks all like white space. And how do you strategically pick and choose what you want to focus on? Especially like when you start to become our size right now, you know, this is a hundred million dollar plus run rate revenue business, operating in multiple cities, soon to be countries. Execution is not easier at scale, it's actually harder. And we as an organization have been going through that evolution. It's amazing. You know, I, I think the, con the common theme with all of you is just hard work and focus. You know, I, I know when I talk to people that, you know, are coming into the business or first time entrepreneurs, I always talk about the, the physicality of what we do and how much of it is just jumping on planes, jumping in Ubers. I, yeah, me too. <laughs> Trust me. Trust me, Rich. And how physical it is. And, and you really have to just have that stamina right and i think that's great and i think the focus is great but i also think um that one of the things in our culture is that we don't talk enough about the mistakes we make and you know i'm sure your publicist if you have any i don't even know don't want me asking this questions but the hell with them i don't deal with them anymore i was one i'm recovering you know i believe that like we should be teaching failure in schools at a very young age to embrace failures because i know i make more than anybody and Rich, I remember with you when we first connected, you had told me about some of the lessons that you learned along the way when you started to scale. I'd love to hear also your thoughts about, you know, learning from your mistakes specifically or just, you know, conceptually and how that's helped you as an entrepreneur and as a founder. Yeah, I think it's learning from your mistakes and reacting to them as quickly as possible and not being afraid to say, wow, yeah, this is not going the way I thought it would. Um, and, and not being afraid of that and not trying to, because it's, it's, it's interesting because it's almost the diametrically opposed force of that grit and that willing and all that stuff because we're also very stubborn in that like we want this to succeed and we're willing to brute force it through grit, sheer will and, or determination. But on the flip side, I'm also saying, well, one of our skill sets is can we just admit when something's not working and it's time to sort of cut, lo cut that loose and move on to something else. So. I remember when we launched, we initially focused on New York as a market to sort of tame the, the CRE data ecosystem here you know, across the five boroughs. And we did that really successfully and, and, and almost easier than, than anticipated. A lot of that has to do with the data is very accessible and all that stuff. 
And so then when we got an initial cash infusion from Bain Capital with the fundamental thesis of, hey, let's scale this puppy nationwide, we're like, well, no problem. We did it in New York. How hard could it be? You know, there's a song. You know, if you do it in New York, you can make it anywhere, right? So. And then reality sets it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then we, we actually, so we did the exact same thing we did in New York and we did it in LA, the second largest, and, and, and by some counts even larger, just the transaction number and all that stuff. Um, and that's where I started to get you know, this, this sort of pit in your stomach, I'm like, oh, this doesn't feel right. You know, this doesn't feel um, as good as it should from a scalability, efficiency, that the cost, the timing, et cetera. But I'm like, no, 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 I'm gonna will this forward, I'm gonna you know, grit, all that stuff. Uh, and we actually launched it in beta, and, and the users were giving a bunch of great feedback, but still, I'm like, ah, let me do the math here. If it takes eight months to do the second market, it's not going to go down, and there's 50 markets that matter in the U.S. times eight months, and like uh, the capital, I'm looking at the bank account, I'm like, all right, no, this does not work. So, you know, I think one of the big lessons and, and, and sort of um, things you have to do as a founder is react when things are wrong and be very clinical and unemotional uh, with that, right? So uh, I think the lack of emotion and just very unbiasedly saying, no, this is not working, I was wrong, or our thesis was incorrect, let's course correct, uh, is and fundamental. You, and you did, yes. right? I mean, that's Thankfully, what we, we did. About. Yes. did. Yes. Gabby, how about you? How do you approach sort of infinite learning, making mistakes in, in the way that you run your company as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, I think quite um, similarly to, to Rich, and I think it is really interesting that kind of that those opposing forces, because I think yeah. that can be that can be a real mistake. Because you, if you're a founder, no doubt you're passionate, no doubt you've got a lot of confidence, strong belief, and that grit. So there is a risk that you're just going after this thing, you know, and and you don't react yeah, quick enough. That's so, true. Look, I mean, I think from the get go, we, we've always had we've always had a vision, but I've never been one to write down five year like clinical right, plans, absolutely. and I and I and I believe that um, that that's not always particularly helpful for businesses that are scaling this fast. I strongly believe that you need to be very responsive and reactive to your customers, and you know, and, and because that that you know, I think that's the risk if you if right. you've got this really clinical stepped out plan that you as the founder has mapped out. Just have blinders on, then the blinders are yeah. on, right? So, you know, I, and that's probably, as to Ryan's point, the bigger you get, the harder it is to do things that way because you've got to carry a whole team with you that way. And so you're going, no, we're going this way. <laughs> you know. okay. um, but, um, yeah, so I, I think you, you want to be agile, you want to be experimental, you want to be very customer focused. Um, you know, but I, I think as well, I mean, you just have to be human about it and authentic about it. I mean, everyone makes mistakes. I think that early, you know, coming out of Australia, you know, and into two new markets, um, into the US and the UK. You know, we've got brand new relationships where we've got, you know, small teams. Um, you know, so you do, you, I'm constantly course correcting at the moment on, well, that's like not going how I thought it would, or, you know, we're gonna need this person and not that person. And, um, you know, so I think you gotta be able to also just readily and quickly admit, yeah, no, it's not working, mm -hmm. um, and respond and react. Um, it's never a straight line, right? I mean, it's just like you're always doing this. As long as you're going that way, right. you know, oh, you're okay. Yeah, you have been. Cross. Jonathan, what about you? A couple of things. So one is uh, recognizing that two steps forward, one step back is still progress. So yeah. you're always going to be making these mistakes. Like you'll hear any of us talk about all the list of mistakes we've made is a lot longer than the list of successes, right? Which is yeah. fine. I mean, to Rich's point, right? You're testing a whole bunch of things and hopefully not all of them work. Not, you don't hope they don't work. Right. but. It means you're testing, uh, things don't work because either the industry is not ready or you didn't develop the product right or any number of reasons, but you're trying new things and you're making mistakes because of that. Um, so one is that kind of two steps forward, one step back is still progress. And then two is uh, not beating yourself up when you make those mistakes. Because as I said, you make a ton more mistakes than not. So you can't sit there and be like, oh, I can't believe we messed this one up. Uh, you have to move on to the next one. Uh, I told somebody this is like a year ago, I was talking to them on a Sunday, and I said, some point during this week, the absolute best thing in the world will happen, and also some point during this week, the absolute worst thing <laughs> will happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can make a guess on any given Sunday <laughs> what that following week, what might be in each of those buckets, but you really have no idea. So you have to be uh, both very comfortable with that uncertainty, um, and then equally comfortable with knowing that that worst thing will happen every given week. You have to like to peak and trough. Right. Emotionally, you have to be comfortable with that high and low, I've always found. Like, yeah. 
or yeah. tolerate it. Or I don't tolerate know. I don't, I don't think I'm comfortable with it. I but freaking, tolerate it. That's the worst part of the job, yeah. I think. You know, but you just get used to it. You get desensitized to it. Like, like the the amount the the stuff has to be really freaking bad to upset me at this point. Yeah. Because like something that would have upset me last year upsets me a lot less this year, and whatever upset me last year was took a lot higher bar than the year before that. I mean, it's like at this point, it's like, Makes a you know, a meteor has to strike the office. But I think early, upset. but I think as an early founder though, like I think <laughs> you're, we're in a different phase right now. I just want to build on this. I think it's really important for people that are looking to, to found businesses. Um, when it's those early days, like your emotions move like your business, like high, low, sideways. And it's, you're so emotionally connected to it and oftentimes you're so financially connected to it, right? Like I remember when I started Convene, like I wasn't making any money, right? So not only are you emotionally connected because it's something you're passionate about, it's this, it's this canvas that you're painting and it's this idea, but then you're also like, I'm living at the same time and they're so <laughs> integrated together. Um, but I will definitely say like over time, you know, now it's like, it takes a lot to get me worried and it takes a lot to get me excited. It's really a great quality that you guys all have it and gal, because it took me 30 years to learn that. You have no yeah, yeah. To all be in therapy, it's great, right? Yeah. No, really though, it took me forever to learn that.